I'm a Polly. This is a podcast. Welcome to the Polly podcast. Uh, just a quick uh, hello and welcome from me. Uh, we have Mr. Tom Nash on the show tonight, also known as DJ Cookie. Are you still DJing? Yes. Yeah? Not while I'm sitting here, but no, yeah, no, no. Gen- no, <laughs> yeah, at this point in my life, yeah. yeah, yeah. Where, where do you do? Are you still in the uh, cell? Yeah, so I, I DJ much less than I used to. Um, but so we we do a couple of parties a year. We used to run weekly, and now we do two a year. Oh. We do one for Mardi Gras. And we do one for Halloween. How's the Mardi Gras? Um, it's good. It's coming up in a couple of weeks, actually. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, and so we just our relationship with running our party now mm. is just we do it when we feel like it's going to be a fun event for yeah. us to host. It's um, and Mardi Gras and Halloween always are because they're dress up events. We get to decorate the club and stuff and it looks great. Oh, and then we do DJ at other places as well when we're asked, but we're mm. at a stage now where we only take the gigs that we want to take. Yeah, yeah. I guess so. Well, I'm playing this weekend actually down in um, Wollongong for a friend of ours who runs a club down there. Oh, so it should be fun. We've done yeah. Wollongong a bit in the past six months and um, they've always responded well to us in Wollongong. I don't know why. Maybe because it's like pie in South of Wollongong. Maybe they, they, their standards are far lower than the rest of <laughs> New South Wales. They're like, yeah, we'll take cookie, whatever. So. Before we get into like how you got into DJing and mm. started all that thing, just run me run me through what your upbringing was like. You grew up in Sydney, right? Uh, I did well. I I actually was born in South Africa, um, but oh. I only lived there for a couple of years, so I don't remember it. But then I grew up in America. Yeah. Uh, until about 89 and then i moved to australia yeah and have been in sydney since then mm. so since i was about nine or something like that i've been in sydney um and my upbringing was boring actually it was just really nothing Sad. to write home about yeah. yeah you know lower middle class kind of idiot yeah. child yeah. uh i i like to play the guitar that was probably the most interesting thing about me which is not saying much Otherwise, just below um, average at school. Not really. Yeah, pretty pretty average at school. <laughs> like, I think, yeah, I performed quite badly at school. Um, not, no, no, sorry, not badly, just unremarkably. <clears throat> like, you yeah. would, yeah. Uh, went to university here in Sydney. Yeah. Uh, was starting to go to university, and then I kind of got the flu, and that put the kibosh on university. Yeah, when I say like, flu, I meant meningococcal. Yeah, I mean, you and, got, like, an extreme merge. Not something I'd recommend. Uh, I think I gave it one star on Yelp, um, but basically it's a cause. It's a cause of blood infection called septicemia, and to stop that from spreading, you have to start chopping off limbs. And yeah. so I lost both legs below the knee, both arms at the elbow. Below the knee. Below the knee. You're like fuck you. No, below the knee. You <laughs> I forgot that I'm talking to someone with a military oh, background. He's like, I've got. I've had my legs cut off below the knee. He's yeah, like, yeah. He's, he's taking it. He's, like, he's like, why is everyone paying this guy? <laughs> yeah. I know, yeah. yeah. Um, That's not a proper application. It isn't. It, no, but I, I know. I know you're joking, but like, it totally. How I feel about my legs is like, I'm not. I don't even give a shit. Like below yeah. the knee amputations, I'm like whatever. Yeah. It's the least disabled part about me because I can walk a flight of stairs. I can do most things. The arms are a bit of a bastard. Yeah. So at what point were they basically like, look, we need to start taking limbs off? What point was it costing you an arm and a leg? Yeah. <laughs> um, Two arms. I paid twice. Legs. Yeah. <laughs> uh, should get a refund. Um, it would have been about six to eight weeks into the whole process. So for the first four weeks, I was in uh, RPA and that was like, I see you, right. I have you on life support and basically try and make sure you don't die. Mm. And then I was transferred to Concord Hospital because they had a burns unit and the burns unit were best equipped to deal with how the meningococcal affects your skin. As you can see, I've got scars everywhere. Mm. And so that's how they um, that's how they would transfer a patient to that. And yeah. they actually did my amputations. Right. Um, and so it would have been definitely six weeks into it and the legs went first that was a simple conversation with one of the doctors who basically just said to me, this has to happen. And I was on such a majestic uh, cocktail of drugs that I was, you know, just going to accept. I was like, okay, fine. I, I didn't really feel that. I was like, I just want to get out of here. Um, and then the arms came like a few weeks after that where they were trying to save my arms as best they could yeah. and maybe take off a few fingers or digits, yeah. which would have been great. Uh, I would have been a lot more independent if I had, hands even mm-hmm. having lost fingers uh but at one point the doctor had to come in and say look you know 
you can keep the arms, but you'll die, <laughs> or you can lose them and live. What would you like to do? Yeah, okay. So, and I was like, well, let's go with the latter. But thank you for asking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, that's how I felt internally. I was like, thank you for asking. It's good that they gave you an option. That's right. It was the first time in that process that I felt like I had some agency over what was happening to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And agency is so important. It's something that we all take for granted all the time. Yeah. So when you just become subject to something that's happening to you, that loss of control uh, is really devastating and it affects you whether you're cognizant of it or not, I guess. Yeah, because um, I I remember um, I was in about week 30 of training and worked for the military and the guy that took me through, one of the guys that took me through training, he um, he got uh, recalled to go back to Afghanistan. He'd already done two tours of Afghanistan and then he perhaps got on this third one, but he brought his family down to Exeter to become a training instructor because he'd done quite a lot for the military already. And he got brought, he had like a specialist skill. He needs to come back, he'll be the only person that can get a job. And on that tour, he basically lost both of his arms. No, no sorry, he lost one arm. So, you know, not as bad as your report mm. He lost one arm and both his legs. Yeah. Quite wow. high up on his legs. Um, Asymmetrical as well. See, yeah. I only had to lose one arm. I told him to take the other one because I can't. <laughs> <laughs> Just thought he'd match. Right? Yeah. That's Easier right. to buy t shirts. That's exactly more. right. Yeah. But um, yeah, so that was the first time where I was sat there and that was like, oh, God, this is real. Yeah. No, right. I actually met that like this guy trained me for quite a long yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. And then you, then you get a phone call of one of your mates saying, oh, I can know, like, yeah, good part of it. Both of his legs and, and his arm. But actually, like, he adapted like, really well. Mm. Like, I know, like, it's obviously a horrific thing. Mm. Like, you have both your, ar- uh, both your arms, both your legs, and heads taken off. But how did you, like, adapt afterwards? Did you bounce back relatively quickly? Was there post traumatic stress? after the rift, like how did you cope with um new life because you're only 19 yeah that's right yeah so i guess um to an extent the adaptation was an iterative process and um there were different phases of it so learning how to walk again was difficult not because walking with two prosthetic legs below knee is difficult but because i had a bunch of wounds on my leg yeah and the manager combo and that would be prohibitive in actually getting a prosthetic on to walk again yeah and so that took months where it probably shouldn't have taken that long Mm -hmm. um but once i was up and walking i think the progress was pretty quick yeah i only when i moved out of hospital i I moved in with my mum again who lived up in the blue mountains at the time and i think i was only living there for six to eight months before I moved out independently to my own place. Yeah. And I think the progress that I found... Did you move somewhere flatter? I did. Yeah, I did, yeah. <laughs> Actually, yes and no, right? So I, I still had like four steps walk, going up to the house because I like a bit of a challenge. Uh, but it wasn't as it wasn't as dire as my mum's place. Mountains, the Blue Mountains must be in the Blue Mountains. Alone. Dude, and it wasn't even the Blue Mountains as a place, right? I moved yeah, to this yeah. place called Mount Victoria and the population is quite low up there. And the house that she had was this, it was quite a small like kind of kit home Mm, and it had a very steep gravel driveway Mm. for fuck's sake, right? And then there was like a a wooden rickety stairs that you would go up and then make a hard left. And then the house was really small, so it was pokey and hard to get around in. And I thought, this is the least accessible place I could have moved (laughs) into, uh, apart from like a two floor walk up in Saigon. Um, But at the end of the day, it was actually perfect because... If I could traverse that, right? yeah. I could traverse anything. And it was a really good place to rehabilitate because I learned, uh, you know, different textures of things to walk on, you know, different heights of stairs to be able to get up and down. Uh, so it, w- it was actually really good. The six, eight months or whatever I spent there was was great. And then moving out onto my own, that's when I became quite adaptable quickly because I was left to my own devices mm-hmm. more often than not. And so... Yeah, it's where like if you want to get something done, you're gonna to have to do it. That's or right. Else to do it. Yeah, yeah. And and being mm-hmm. forced into that position forces you to start thinking differently to solve problems. Mm-hmm. Whereas when I had somebody around before, I might have just opted for the path path of least resistance. You know, yeah. Where I'd say, oh, um, I have a candle to light my cigarettes or something. It's just like, oh, the candle blew out. Would you mind lighting the candle again? That will happen, right? Yeah. But then 
if I'm on my own and the candle blows out, I have to think, how do I light a how fucking light candle, fucking right? Candle, yeah. And I'd sit there with a big lighter and two hooks just trying to turn that turn spinny thing, thing like right? Lighter. And then you would mm. you would make these realizations where you kind of like, I'd, I remember, so there was a, I was trying to light cigarettes and I was using a candle for a while and that would always blow out. And then I thought, okay, well, I'll use the toaster if that blows out. So I put the cigarette in my mouth and I put the cigarette in the toaster. <laughs> it's not dangerous. Don't try it at home. Yeah. Um, <laughs> not recommend. Ever. And then the next thing that I did was I w- when the toaster broke, I would roll up a piece of A4 paper and stick it underneath the griller and light, like set fire to it and then run out into the backyard, light the cigarette and then stomp it out. And this one time I was doing that and I walked past the barbecue and I saw these barbecue matches. Right. And I'm like, oh, of course. I can just use barbecue matches. Mm. So I spent the rest of the afternoon just sitting there, just striking matches, just getting it right Mm. Um, and being a general fire hazard. But, you know, since that point, I just always lit my cigarettes with matches. Um, You know, the answers to problems that you need to solve are sometimes not the way everyone else does something, Mm. but often hiding in places that you wouldn't otherwise look. Yeah, after you to like, obviously playing the guitar before and then obviously very difficult to do with no arms right afterwards you obviously i listened on another podcast that you did you created something which meant that you could still play the guitar so i initially just wanted to play the guitar again and Mm. so i devised and designed all of these little contraptions that could potentially be built to enable me to play the guitar again yeah but they all had their own problems i guess um and some of them were more elaborate than others And I guess what happened was I started thinking in reverse, which was that, well, what, what's my actual objective here? Mm. You know, do I, do I want to play like Jimi Hendrix again? You know, like chances are I never would have played like Jimi Hendrix, right? Even with hands. Yeah. yeah. And so, no, it wasn't. My objective was to be able to uh, write music. It was to be able to play with my friends. So I needed a more simplified approach. And as soon as I broke it down like that, it became obvious. I was like, I just need something that I can play chords. And so I worked out that if I tuned a guitar in a particular way and then devised a slide system that I could stick my hook into and a pick system that I could uh, fit my other hook into, I could just play it on my lap like a lap steel. Yeah. Right. So it was really about redefining the problem at that point. Mm. And it's the same thing with lighting the cigarette. Right. Is it I didn't. The problem wasn't how do I use a lighter? The problem is how do I set fire to something? Yeah. And all of these little iterative adaptations that I learned through having a disability were things that forced me to think differently about solving problems, Mm. sometimes solving problems in reverse, sometimes redefining the actual objective before you start solving the problem. So you be, you basically became a, like a really high level problem solver. Yeah, which yeah. is which is well, what, or a low level, or a low level, solver, yeah. low level, a low but, level but more impressive problem solver. But things that are, things that are complicated, you find mm. a simple route to to, mm. to complete them. Or well, um, just the the route that <clears throat> yeah. no one else thought to take. Yeah, I yeah, guess. yeah, yeah. But it, you look at it from a different perspective, and I always think of this when I I see people in general society where they're like, I don't know, whether they're searching for a job or trying to get a pay rise or doing all of these normal things that I personally and you might as well think, oh, that's simple. I'm just I just got to ask for it, or if I can't get it, I just have to create it, mm. right? So. I would think to myself that if I if I keep applying for jobs and I and I and I fail mm. repetitively, I'll just become self-employed and start the service rather mm. than looking to get a job in the service. Yeah. Do you feel like that after you uh, after the disease um, took place and you obviously had the amputations, then you have to go for all of these low-level problems that when it came to like high-level stuff, because now you're a key keynote speaker you've done ted talks you Mm. fly all over the world to tell your story um and inspire others and obviously talk about problem solving Mm. which is which is a hugely key thing for people to Mm. to understand better that it's not as difficult as you think it might be um do you feel that people are just over complicating things a lot when they just look at everyday life i hate to paint everyone with the same brush Mm. so I think there's definitely a contingent of people who overcomplicate things. I yeah. don't think it's everyone all the time. Yeah. And you know, there's always a very personalized experience to problems that people are having. I think people are 
<clears throat> more likely to get stuck in the microcosm of their world and they let that affect them and their mindset more than they ought to. Mm. Uh, my friend sent me this amazing uh, meme the other day and it was like a photo of the solar system or maybe it was even the Milky Way and then there was an arrow pointing at where Earth was and it was like, this is you crying in the shower. <laughs> <laughs> which I thought was fucking excellent. Yeah. Um, sometimes you need that that perspective, and sometimes yeah, we do overcomplicate things. And you know, um, as I always get made fun of by my partner, I always say that uh, no one cares about your life as much as you do. Yeah. Um, but it's true, and I you know I think that we place too much impetus on what uh, or importance on what people think of us of whether we're doing the the right thing or whether we're doing the thing the way everyone else does it. Um, for some people, it's easier to take a path less trodden. Uh, but for most people, I think, um, yeah, they, they put too much importance on their lives and how much it affects the world. Just do what makes you happy. And, um, yeah, I think... The overcomplication factor is probably rife amongst many subgroups of people, but not everyone. So, like when you became a, you obviously got into DJing afterwards. Mm. After the guitar, so do you still play the guitar the way that you? No, no, I don't, yeah. Because so, I always just needed a creative outlet, mm. and you know sometimes that's uh, music in terms of producing DJ music. Mm. For a while, it was being in a band, but also I like you know photography or film and yeah. you know like i like creative outlets yeah it, it doesn't have to be one thing or the other yeah so but, but then you 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 started a dj night right and you didn't you'd never done a set before yeah that's right so you just mm. decided like did you just approach a club say we want to do a night pretty like yeah we um <clears throat> so when you think about the paths people take to achieve particular things, you know, they're often uh, subject to something called path dependence, which is basically that history matters and the way that things are always done are the way that they're going to be done in the future and the only way to achieve a goal. Mm. Um, and I guess I learned pretty quickly that there were different ways to achieve what you wanted, whether it be through something as simple as lighting a cigarette or learning to play the guitar again or whatever it was. And so when looking at the trajectory of how people became DJs, I had an acute understanding of it because I did some work experience for a nightclub in King's Cross mm. uh, before we started the club. Which and club? It was at Candy's apartment. Candy's. Yeah. <clears throat> and um, I was in charge of taking a lot of the applications of DJs who would, you could tell had put a lot of work into creating a brand, learning how to DJ, they'd bought equipment, they'd done a mixtape, they'd, mm. you know, they'd spent six to 12 months of their lives to create this proof of concept product. Mm. And then they come to someone like me or someone at Candy's and say like, can I have a set for $50 yeah. an hour? Which is fucking demoralizing. Right? Yeah. And, and what's more demoralizing is I'd get a hundred of these in one day. Wow. So you're like, there's gotta be a better way, right? To mm. do that and so we thought uh well what happens if we just start at the end of that thought process what happened what happens if we just make the club ourselves and then put ourselves on as the headline djs like if we're booking we yeah. can book ourselves yeah just book right? yourselves yeah yeah <clears throat> and so so that's what we did we came up with a concept for a night um and we we tried to think of the night holistically not in a woo-woo way but in a an acute understanding that the reason that people go to nightclubs isn't just for the DJ, which is, I think, a thought process that a lot of DJs fall into the trap of thinking. Yeah, sometimes um, it's just to go and have a good time. Oh, you don't always, really care always. about Always, it's not even sometimes. <laughs> yeah. It's like no, nobody yeah. gives a shit about the DJ. Like, they say to their friends that they want to go and see a DJ, but that's more of a signaling thing. Like, at the yeah. end of the day, they want to go to a club where their friends are going, where they're going to have a good time, where it's going to be busy, where they're going to meet people, where they have good drinks and the vibe's good. And Yeah. Yeah, who's DJing is the last thing on that list. And so I guess we understood that from an early age and we were like, okay, well, what if we create a club 
that it doesn't really matter who's DJing. Mm. Um, but we have a theme night. It's at a place that people really like. Uh, we decorate ourselves. We have a community atmosphere. The person working on the door is a friend of ours. The person working behind a bar is somebody in our friends group or something like that. Everybody that DJs there are people that we know. They're not like, you know, DJ fuckface from Melbourne who's charging me 1200 bucks yep. to come up and stay at a, yeah. the, the local Ibis hotel. <clears throat> or whatever. And so we completely flipped the model on its head and we thought, you know, let's just create more like a community space. Yeah. And uh, we just got lucky with it. Like people responded to it well. And then we put ourselves on as the DJs and uh, yeah, our opening night was my first set. Didn't really know how to DJ. Um, but, you know, taking into consideration all the things <laughs> I said about how people don't give a shit, it didn't matter, right? Yeah, yeah, Because I was just playing track No after one walked track. out at 2 o'clock in yeah, the morning. Yeah, and I was like, oh, well, that wasn't beat me properly. <laughs> so what is it, one twenty? I'll be going home There's now. There's like one guy, of course not. one guy that's sober that on the dance yeah. floor at 2am that's like, that's oh, exactly this fucking right. DJ shit. Yeah, and everyone else's like, I don't care. just dropped Woo. his third pinger and he's like, well, that wasn't very good, was it? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, obviously that didn't matter. <clears> and and the, the great thing was, was... That was a perfect environment for me to learn how to DJ because I'm DJing in front of 500 people mm. on a weekly basis. So you get proper feedback while you're doing it. You're honing your skills in the mm. moment. And we learn how to play real quick. It's um, it, it's a little bit like, I find it like in professional scenarios as well, or any sort of career where people put barriers in front of themselves, right? So in front like, of themselves oh. or do you mean like gatekeepers in <clears throat> communities? Well, gatekeepers in communities, or if they try, if they if they say, "Oh, yeah, I'd really like to do that," but until then, mm. like I've got it, I've got to like, I can only do that when I have that skill set. Yeah. Or I can only do this. Whereas, like, I I always thought that if you just turn up and you're average, you can figure it out afterwards. It's like the Richard yeah. Branson saying: "It's just say yes, and then you figure it out later, right?" Yeah, fake it till you make it. I well, like to say fake it till you fake it because fake you've it never actually fake it. made it. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that sort of plays into that whole idea of imposter syndrome, mm. which people always find when they do have success in whether it be careers or creative pursuits or whatever, mm. um, and they didn't start from a position of having, uh, you know, a breadth of knowledge or skills or talent or whatever it is. They yeah. always feel like the imposter. Yeah. And I felt like that in every single part of my life. Um, and I still do, right? Like, I feel like an imposter right now. I'm sitting here talking to you on a podcast. Yeah. Like, why do you want to talk to me? Like, yeah, what's yeah, yeah. so interesting, yeah. right? Yeah, what is but, interesting? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how we're ending. <laughs> yeah, just um, a good night, guys. It's been really good talking to you. <laughs> but I guess in the last, I'd say it was maybe, probably in the last, like, <clears throat> five or six years mm. i've started to love the feeling of it yeah because it you know as the imposter i'm always meeting new and interesting people and learning new things i'm in places where i don't deserve to be talking to far more interesting people than myself and i'm enriching my own life by being the imposter yeah so why would i ever want to change that yeah you know the expert has nothing to learn but the yeah. imposter is always it's fine you do you do go to those events don't you and you see the person that you can definitely tell loves the sound of their own voice the whole time yeah and they're like they've obviously got this thing in their head that they are god's gift and that's a problem because they're never going to learn anything new yeah whereas if you always go into the scenario with oh what can this person teach me yeah then you're never you're never ever going to achieve that top yeah level, and, right? and i yeah. imagine it wouldn't be terribly interesting being no. an expert amongst people who weren't yeah. Like that would be just boring as shit. Yeah. Let me ask you a question. Go on. This is the third fucking real estate podcast I've been on. Mm. Well, technically I'm a mortgage broker. What? And I don't really Shut up. care. I, <laughs> <laughs> what, why is it? Yeah. Like, okay, so I've been on the, this one, obviously, Lifestyle Pirates with Big J. Yeah. I mean, and then yeah. I also went on Little Fish which is a Melbourne-based, right. their, their property dudes. Yeah, go. What is it with real estate people and podcasts? I don't know. Like, I I didn't start the podcast um, to really talk about real estate. No, but all. that's the thing. Is yeah, none yeah. of you talk about, like, I haven't talked about real estate on any of them. Yeah. So, like, this, this, is, this is essentially why I started the podcast, right? Um, one, I fucking hate marketing. Okay. So if you imagine those guys that you see in the eastern suburbs and the lower north shore and they go, yeah. welcome to number seven, blah, blah, blah. And they yeah. walk around and they do the whole <laughs> like 
ten thousand dollar shoot where the you know some guys come mm. in and he's got his bloody you know that thing that flies up in the air and does whatever drone, drone yes. whatever. So um, I I would rather that people get to know me, mm. and then the byproduct of that is they might end up using my services. Yeah. So this is what I suspected, right? Yeah. And I, <clears throat> when I was thinking about it today, when I was coming here, because I was like, mm. "Is it real stuff?" Because you don't see like you know dentists doing podcasts do. Um, maybe they should. But yeah, maybe they should, <laughs> right? But I'm thinking, why are there more real estate uh, agent podcast or real estate people podcasts, whatever it is? Yeah, yeah. Here's my suspicion. You tell me what you think of this, okay. right? I think to be in the game of real estate, it selects for people with a particular level of charisma, mm-hmm. or at, at the very least, confidence. Easy right? tiger. And and those people are constantly adjacent film crews. So at one point in time, the conversation will come up over a couple of beers. Maybe we should start a podcast. Yeah, yeah. Is that how it happened with you? Yeah. Look, I I wanted to start. I wanted to start a podcast earlier than that. I wanted to start a podcast about five six years ago when I was living in Dubai. The reason I didn't start it is because that I didn't think that I had enough life lessons to be able to sit there. Mm. One, ask the right questions. Okay. Two, be able to talk on a level that I think I would be worthwhile people listening to um whereas now like i've been around the block a bit i've got a couple of kids spent a long time in the military i've lived in a few countries i feel like i have something worth talking about to people Mm. but also i'm still curious to learn more and when i grew up i didn't have a father figure from really the age of 13 onwards interesting you're from east anglia aren't you yes yes whereabouts in east anglia new market where all the horses are get the fuck out of here yeah that's Swear. where my family are from. Is it really? Yes, it is. You're fucking joking. I'm not. So Holy my, shit. Yeah, there's a little uh, town that you may or may not know called Carlton. Yeah. Just outside of Newmarket. Yeah. Maybe it's like 20 minutes out 20 of 20 minutes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, And I used to go there as a kid. Get the fuck yeah, out yeah. of there. And they had the horse racing in Newmarket. Yeah, I yeah. I actually went back there in 2018 uh, because it was well, my auntie who everyone uh, moved up north to Warrington. Yeah. Uh, subsequent to my uncle at the time getting a job up at the university there. Mm. Uh, but everyone was in Carlton, you know, before that. And 2018, I went back for her um, subsequent wedding and we drove up, passed through Newmarket and um, yeah. and Carlton and everything. I hadn't been there That's since mad. I was a kid. That's and mad. Yeah. How about that? Yeah. I know a few people from... It's weird. Like, uh, I know a few Brits and a few of them are actually from... So, you know, my, my brother-in-law... Was from uh, Barry St Edmunds. Yeah, so Barry, well. Barry's yeah. like I was literally in Barry, and but my mum, that's where she she works out. Mm. Yeah. yeah, right. That's my people from that part of the world. Yeah, well, it was famous because I actually went to the school where there was a huge story where the caretaker had um, basically my year group. The caretaker mm. had murdered two of the kids in year seven. Wow. And it was Holly Holly and Jessica, the name was on the on the story. On what, so the girl the, what school was this? Soham, it was called. Soham, right. And yeah. the girl was wearing a Manchester United top and the the other girl was wearing a Tottenham top. Mm. And that was the famous image that went worldwide. It was all over the world. Yeah. Like it was just it was just wild. But I was I literally joined that school like six months after it happened. Wow. So we were thrown into this like whirlwind of cameras everywhere and the BBC trying to ask you questions and, and all this thing, but yeah, it was. Um, they say it's funny because Cambridge is on the doorstep of Newmarket. Yeah, and they say oh, I always used to say to people, "Oh, I'm from Cambridge," because it's yeah. easier for people to understand than the, the town where there's only forty thousand people that live there. Yeah. It's in the middle of, in, in, in the in the middle of the countryside. So they go, "Oh, yeah, you're from Cambridge, are you?" And I used to go, "Well, I'm not Asian, so I don't go to the university." <laughs> <laughs> You've seen this. I wasn't. Process. I wasn't the smart. Per, like, and I, my mum hasn't got the money. She just works at Tesco's, which is like yeah. like our version of Coles. Um, but yeah, no, yeah. So that's. I can't believe that you. That well, was, here's yeah. here's something that's a little bit like mm. even more coincidental. So mm. remember, I told you I DJ'd in Wollongong last year. Yeah. So we played this day, day festival, uh, and then we played the after party afterwards at this nightclub. Yeah. And uh, getting to the nightclub, and we're taking it, and it's heaving. Right, we're just like pushing our way through people and it's just like sweat tripping Because you guys were so busy and it was... Well, it wasn't, so like, it, wasn't, it wasn't because of us, trust me. Right? It was just after the day party. Yeah. But this guy was playing from the UK. His name was Josh Butler, right? right. And I'd heard of him, but never met him or anything like that. We were mm. taking over from him. And uh, he takes over, like, he pulls his headphones out of the desk and yeah. met him and was like, hey, how are you doing? And I heard he had a Manchester accent. And I was like, oh, I said... um, 
where are you from? And he said, I'm from England. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Where? I'm like, yeah, where? I know that you're from Manchester. And he's like, oh, okay, yeah, that's good. Like, But I'm in a place you might not have heard of. It's uh, like Warrington. And so now my <clears throat> family now lives in a place called Appleton, which is just outside of Warrington, right? Just south of Warrington. And I was like, yeah, I fucking know Warrington. And I was like, well, whereabouts in Warrington are you from? And he's like, oh, well, you definitely wouldn't know. He's like, I live in a place called Stockton Heath. Yeah. It is 800 meters from where <laughs> I'm And I'm like, dude, I was there like last year, like check out this photo on my Instagram. Yeah. And he was fucking blown away. And I thought to myself, a few times this has happened to me in life, right? Where I've met a person and we have a really strange connection like that. I mean, the most yeah. extreme example I remember was once, maybe 15 years ago, I was in Strasbourg and I'm, I'm walking down the street and I'd been in Paris like the week before and this guy was driving past on his bike and he stopped and he was like, it's okay, like, hey, were you on like Rue de Louvre yesterday, like in Paris? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, oh, I saw you walking past, like now you're here. I was like, oh, that's a coincidence. Yeah, yeah. But I can understand how he'd recognize me because the guy with two hooks, right? Yeah. But it got me thinking. I was like, how often do we pass people all the time? I think about that all the time. And because there might not be something like, oh, they've got hooks or whatever it you is. You didn't take the right road or you yeah, didn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, so <clears throat> I reckon we are habitual as humans to an extent where we probably run into the same people. We're well, not run into, but pass them mm. on a far more regular basis than we would otherwise believe. I went to um, Paihia in the north of New Zealand. So it's about, I can't remember how many hours, X many hours north of Auckland. Mm. It's called the Winterless North. Mm. It's where all the dolphins go swimming and everything. Oh, nice. And we were on this um, <clears throat> we we're on this boat where the guy had turned, it used to be, it used to transport cars on the boat. So it's like a double decker mm. thing. You get as many cars, it's like new cars on there. And it would, it was all like old school, um, wooden, wooden wheel at the back. Mm. And this guy, we were on there for, I was on there for three days. You can swim with dolphins in the morning. It was absolutely incredible. Started talking Amazing. to the guy who was essentially his assistant. Yeah. British, oh, where are you from? Blah, blah, blah. I'm from Bury St. Edmunds. Mm. And I've lived here for two years and this is what I do every yeah. morning. And he just put his suit on every morning, went for a swim with the dolphins. I was like, this is, well, I think I was about 19 then. Wow. So I just joined the military, mm. but he had opened up like my eye to the world at that point. I think a lot of people spend too much time in their own town and actually yeah. you've got to get out. Yeah, totally. In the world. You obviously like, hmm. Yeah. you travel a lot. Yeah. Right? You like you got into speaking mm. and uh, travel all over the world doing it. You, We talk about that tall poppy syndrome and all that type of thing. Mm. When was the f the first gig that you got paid to do a key key speak? Oh, you that's just a good like... question. I don't remember. <laughs> Actually, no, wait, I do remember. I, I got paid to do a public speaking gig way before I could do public speaking. Right. And way before I did it as a career. Uh, it would have been early 2000s. Somebody thought it might be a good idea to put me on stage in front of people. It was not. Okay. Um, because I had nothing to talk about. I mean, I actually also got approached by a publisher for a book when I first got out of hospital. Uh, and I was a little bit put off by that, which <laughs> yeah. I don't think would be a particularly interesting book. Not to say that my book right now is that interesting, but it would have been far worse if I'd written it then. And so I knew that I, I needed to live a little and, and to have done some things and to achieve something to actually have <clears throat> enough that I, I could consider a, a compendium of stories at least. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the speaking stuff was exactly the same. It's like, what am I going to talk about? Talk about? Uh, <clears throat> and I didn't want to fall into being one of those people that just tells a really uh, unfortunate story. <clears throat> I'm also not a very negative person in that respect. Like, I complain a lot about trivial shit, but I never complain about macro stuff. I never complain about having a disability or things I, like that. I complain about trivial shit all yeah. the time. It's great. I think it's therapeutic. I yeah, really I like do. It. My missus hates it. Yeah, right. I'm in the car. Within the first 30 seconds mm. to 60 seconds, I've told someone to fuck themselves and move on. Yeah. And I find it quite therapeutic. <clears throat> <clears throat> so do you think what it is about being in a car, if you're walking into an office building, right, and someone walks in front of you, you don't turn around to them and you're like, fuck you. Do you? Right? You're like, oh, sorry, excuse me, like whatever it is, yeah. right? 
but because you're mm-hmm. insulated by you know this metal and also you're that far away from them yeah. there's a different psychological relationship you have to them yeah i say that i'm only racist inside a car <laughs> 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 there's gonna be a better there's gonna be a better word for it like um auto re- no that doesn't sound good yeah i don't know auto racism i don't like the sound of that sorry yeah it sounds sorry. automatic when you're in a car yeah. it just gives you this newfound i don't know you yeah. just feel like you're invincible in a car don't you mm. and i feel like it gets out like it's kind of like your inner tourette's right yeah. like you want to just like have you seen the movie Ali G where he's like this to the police officers is sticking oh, his fingers man, up? I have seen that, but too long ago. But it, yeah, it, it yeah. is like, yeah, my, I get in the car. My missus thinks it's unhealthy, but I think it's healthy for me to just F and blind behind the wheel. Yeah. It gets it all out, you know? That's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, and, you know, I had this conversation with a few people on podcasts recently uh, where I've resigned myself to the fact that I could only live in a city that I, I, I like 70% of it or 80% of it or something like that. Because yeah. I need something to complain about. Like yeah, if, it was, if it was too perfect, I, um, it would piss me off. I got pulled over last week by a police officer for not stopping at a stop sign. Right. Now, it was one of those crossroads where you can actually see if there's any cars. Oh, I, I so thought you, you were going to say it was one of those metaphorical crossroads. No, no, no. <laughs> No, it wasn't. It was just really annoying. Yeah. So, so, I, so I like pulled up towards the stop sign and you, you're supposed to, like in the UK, they mm. use common sense. Obviously, they don't use common sense over in Australia. Yeah. Um, but um, so I pulled, I pull up to the stop sign, but I don't come to a full stop. Mm. So I just drive on because I'm like, there's no cars. Yeah. And then I go, woo, woo, woo. And I'm like, oh, for fuck's sake, what have yeah. I done wrong here? Anyway, he gets the breathalyzer out. I'm like, oh, it's just a routine check. He's like, why didn't you stop at the stop sign? Mm. He and said, I said, because well, well, I've been drinking. I, I said, yeah, 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 because I've had like six whiskeys. <laughs> um, I said, well, I just dropped the kids off and there's no cars at the crossroads. So I just drove over it. Mm. And he was like, but that's how crashes can happen. And I went, with who? Yeah. Because I was the only car. Yeah, thanks. Dad. <laughs> it's like, and, but it does baffle me the lack of common sense with that type of situation where it's like, you know, mm. God, but that that's one of those trivial guess, things that drives me nuts. The thing that you could take from that is that, you know, if, if three hundred dollar fine and three demerit points. <laughs> no, Fucking that's not what he got, was it? Yeah, he out. didn't let me go. Oh, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. He got bullied at school. I know he did. You sure. know he did. Yeah. Well, how do you know this? Well, he would have let me go otherwise, wouldn't he? Oh right. <laughs> I thought you meant like I've got a friend of a friend who's fucking. Um, nah. No, it's yeah, interesting because like, okay, here's what I think you could take as a positive from that, apart from the fine, which I think is a bit of a bummer. Yeah, I don't. Know. Um, I mean, if come you on, live, tell me. <laughs> if you live in a society <laughs> where the police have so much free time on their hands that they're pulling people over for not stopping at stop signs, you probably live in a pretty safe area. I would say that that's the first time someone said made that analogy to me and I kind of, okay. Yeah. I take it back, Mr. You Police <laughs> Officer. You've obviously got so much free time, there's not enough crime going on that you yeah, can yeah. find me $300. And it is so, pretty safe here, I think. Like, I oh, yeah, really yeah, really. yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's great. I, we went, we drove to La Perouse, um last year. Mm. And I parked in the wrong area. So <laughs> I parked in an area where I shouldn't have parked or like right. I shouldn't have parked in that area. Um, it was like indigenous only area, oh, right? right? So I parked there and I come back and th- this is the first thing that's ever happened to us in Australia. Mm. I come back, the windscreen wipers are like ripped off the car and one of the, two of the, two of the side mirrors are like smashed in. Is that right? And all the kids are like playing outside the front of this house and they're just giggling, right? Yeah, yeah. And my missus gets, she's fuming about this situation. Mm. And I sit there and I was like, well, that's the first thing that's happened to us in Australia. She's like, are you not annoyed? Like, we've got to get new window wipers. Those little shits over there have done blah, blah. I was like, back in the UK, babe, every single area has Mm. a, uh, what they call housing commission over here. They call it council estates. But they don't just, like, they have to have it in every single area. So yes. for X many houses that are built in one particular area, there yeah. has to be X many council house. Mm. So you, unfortunately, there's crime all over the place. But you go to London, you go into Chelsea, yeah. you go one street down the wrong road, it's your fault if you went down that street. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I just said to the missus, it's our fault for parking here, we shouldn't have parked it. Mm. It's obviously not our place to park, let's go just park somewhere else next time. Yeah, that's But her, her um, she got super frustrated, spent the whole afternoon annoyed, and I spent the afternoon, I was like, that's yeah. the... If, if if the worst thing that's happened to us since living in Sydney is that our windscreen wipers got yeah. ripped off, 
that's not a bad place to be. True. Right? And you're, you're <clears throat> able to offer that different, you know, framing to her. And Perspective, I, yeah. You know, Lauren does that with me sometimes when I'm complaining about something really <laughs> stupid. Like we, we got back from the States last year and as soon as we got back, my I had a like a pressure sore on my leg. Mm. which was pretty bad to the point where I, like I could walk around, but it was, it was pretty painful. Yeah. And I was just like cursing it. And she was just like, well, you know, at least it happened here where we can go to your prosthetist and get it fixed out. And like, if it happened when we're in the States, like we would have been fucked. Yeah. Or in Bali is, or something. Yeah. 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 Have been fucking which is totally true. And sometimes you need someone around to offer that perspective because you're too narrow framed yeah. and in, enraged in that moment. Yeah, that yeah. It's really good to have someone to offer a different perspective. Let's go back to the book because we went on a massive tangent there. Yeah, I told so, you. Yeah, yeah, I warned you, didn't I? It's yeah. fine. It's good. <laughs> it all makes a good story. Yeah. Um, so yeah, they they wanted you to publish a book, but obviously you were like nineteen at the time, and mm. like really, what life events other than playing the guitar and yeah. going through secondary school and stuff like that? Not much. Yeah, it was at that point, and 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 speaking <clears throat> goes hand in hand with that, no pun intended. But um, it's. I didn't have anything worthy to talk about. I didn't have anything worthy to write about. And so I felt like I needed to, you know, actually achieve some something that a normal person would mm. or even better than a normal person would before I can put pen to paper or start talking about my experiences. So mm. it, I didn't I didn't want it to be that early. And so I did do a couple of talks early that I got paid a stupid small amount of money for and then stopped doing them for like 15 years. Um, and then I, I think you need the life experience, don't you, to be able to... Yeah, well, to make it good. If you want to make it good. Yeah. If you want to actually provide value to people. And I think I'm just starting to be able to do that. My hope is that five years from now, my keynotes will be 10 times better than they are now. Yeah. Uh, I don't think they're bad now, but I, I hope they'll be better. What kind of life events are we talking about that's happened in the last 15 years that you kind of feel relate better to the listener or, you know, mm. you're not just talking about the instant when you're 19 where you've had your, yeah. you know, your, you've amputated. Well, many of the stuff <clears throat> that we've talked about, about learning how to play guitar again, about starting a club mm. um, and doing things a different way, about starting my own company and business. Uh, we did record label and all the various things that, you know, problem solving things, but also, I mean, I talk a lot about a concept called anti-fragility. Earlier on, you asked whether I'd had PTSD, which I didn't get around to uh, mentioning my response to. And that was um, that, no, I didn't. But what I think I had was something called post-traumatic growth, which is a reasonably well-documented psychological phenomenon whereby people who go through traumatic events actually grow from the experience and feel better and stronger as a result of it. Yeah. And I only really discovered that topic uh, or that, that term, I should say, about five years ago or so. And I started reading into it a lot and thinking to myself, fuck, this is what I feel like I've been experiencing. Because, you know, if you go through something like I went through, you always have people saying like, yeah, but, you know, deep down, you're really upset. Aren't you? You're really depressed. <laughs> yeah. And I felt like an idiot. I'm like, I'm not, not really, like, I'm yeah. fine. Just yeah, yeah, yeah. stop asking. Like, yeah, yeah. They, they, they won't accept the fact that you're okay with it. Yeah. It's, it's like if I said to you, like, oh, but you've really got PTSD from being in the military. Yeah. And, you, yeah. Know, you said to me before, like, look, I lucked out. Yeah. And I'm if glad, I were yeah. to just, like, a dog with a rag, be like, but you but do. Have you really talk to someone about it. Like, yeah. 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 Fuck off. Yeah, like, fuck off. I'm yeah. actually fine. Um, and I actually feel better for the experience. Mm. And that was anomalous, at least in the, the categories that I felt I resided within. And um, when I started reading about po post-traumatic growth, I was like, I think this is what happened to me. Uh, being able to completely reframe negative events to get something positive out of them, whether it be problem solving or whether it be learning to see uh, the silver lining in negative events, learning from them and becoming stronger and a better person as a result, and then disseminating that information to other people. Like, this is all really good and valuable behavior and actions. And so then I finally had a, a discourse to kind of pay attention to. And then a few years ago, I read a book by a guy called Nassim Taleb called Anti-Fragility. And as soon as I read that, I was like, ah, oh, fuck, this is 
This Who's that by again? Just sorry, just your... Nicholas Nassim Taleb. Okay. Uh, so he's actually an options trader. Uh, funnily enough, <laughs> there's a lot of similarities between economics and psychology. Interestingly enough. Yeah, I would say and, there uh, is actually. Yeah. <clears throat> he's, he's written some great books. This is uh, Anti-Fragility is my favorite. And Anti-Fragility is exactly what it sounds like. It's the opposite of fragility. And before he coined that term, there was actually no name for it. So you had something that was fragile and then in the middle, it would be something that's resilient in that it's unaffected by stresses or disorder. And then anti-fragile is something that responds positively to stresses to or stress, disorder. Yeah. So <clears throat> a, wine, a glass like this is fragile. Because if I knock it off the table, we all know what's going to happen. This table itself is probably resilient, robust. It'd be hard for us to break it, right? Mm -hmm. But your muscular system is anti-fragile. Because if you put stress on it, if you if you lift weights, it gets stronger. Yeah. Right? And so if we take that analogy and apply it to our psychology, um, to be anti-fragile is to benefit from disadvantage or adversity or stresses or pressures and things like that. And it's a mindset shift. You know, it's, it's the way that you uh, frame things in your head and it might be how you manage expectations or how you adapt in new environments or you know how you view uh, negative events uh, whatever it is like they're all practices and they're all skills anyone can do it right you don't have to have gone through something awful to have that mindset mm. it's easier you know because you're kind of forced to uh, but I think anyone can do it and so what I talk about in keynotes is what I like to talk about the most in keynotes is anti-fragility. That's a really cool concept. Mm. I've never actually heard of that before. Um, Post-traumatic growth and anti-fragility. Yeah. Post-traumatic growth is a really interesting one because I think it's true, right? Mm. Like you go through really difficult times, but actually it doesn't kill you. And you come out the other end and you're a bit more resilient and you grow yeah. from it. So um, anti-fragility <clears throat> sort of, uh, post-traumatic growth is something that is observed in some people. Yes. And it's or not some people that, it doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. They don't necessarily it goes one way or other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, anti-fragility is basically like a, a more complicated extension of the quote by Frederick Nietzsche, that which does not kill me only makes me stronger. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It gets a little bit more complicated with anti-fragility because... Um, Nassim Taleb talks about anti-fragility in the context of complex systems. So mm. he's an economist. So you think about airlines, yeah. right? Airline, The airline industry as a whole is anti-fragile, right? Yeah. Because every flight that you get gets safer after there's been a crash. Yeah. Right? Because there's all sorts of systems that are put in place and, you know, to make sure that that doesn't happen again. And so the industry itself works in, uh, with regulatory bodies and stuff to ensure that crashes don't happen as much mm. as they used to. And increasingly, uh, flying gets safer and safer as we go on. Um, in, information is anti-fragile, right, as a, as a concept. There's a thing, I was actually talking to someone about this yesterday. I forget who it was. Somebody who quite liked Barbara Streisand. Perhaps it was my first cousin once removed. I was reading Bar <laughs> Barbara Streisand's um, autobiography or something like that. <clears throat> and there's a thing called the Barbara Streisand effect. Right, okay. Which is... Uh, it was named after her because she was, there were these paparazzis that had taken photos of her house with her pool that was in Malibu and they'd taken it from a helicopter and she was trying to get these photos taken down from various websites. And so she started, enacted legal action against the paparazzi uh, photographer or whatever it was. Sure. And just due to the litigation, these it promulgated these photos so they were on every fucking every media outlet yeah. you could ever see. Yeah, like what so, Harry's doing now. Yeah, right? So, so, so you know, your ability <clears throat> to try to conceal information is the best way to promote it a lot yeah, of the time. Yeah, right? yeah. So it's anti-fragile. Yeah. So you, you try and um, suppress information and it's the best way to promulgate it. Yeah. Well, um, it's like uh, humour works in that way, right? Because yeah. when someone takes the piss out of you, if you absorb it and just laugh it off, well, humor There's is kind of like a meme, a, isn't it? Like it can be a meme or a in gif, a way. Yeah. yeah Which yeah. are my two favorite things on the planet, actually, is memes and gifs. Yeah. I reckon half of my responses to uh, my uh, workforce are uh, gifs. Yeah. So I just respond with like a cheers or hello or whatever. Do you want to know something interesting? Mm. Uh, last year I interviewed Richard Dawkins on Sage. Mm. And I don't know if you know this, but he was the one that coined the term meme. Really? Did you know that? No. So if you read his book from the 70s called The Selfish Gene, he talks about a meme as an idea that perpetuates itself of its own volition. 
right? Wow. So a meme doesn't necessarily have to be a stupid cat video or something like that. A meme can be an idea that I tell you mm. that promulgates itself. So you go and tell your friend and he tells three friends and like whatever it is. Mm. And genes are memes in a way, right? And I got to ask him on stage, I was like, <laughs> how do you feel about the contemporary definition of meme being boiled down to, you know, stupid cat <laughs> I was fuming. Yeah. Well, I mean, he's such a proper guy. He's like, well, you know, yeah, yeah. don't know what I think about it, but it's accurate. You know? But it is um, humor. Humor works in the best way, like because I, I, if you take offense to something, mm. then meme memes and gifs are hilarious. I love them. I think they take. I think they add humor to every situation. But um, I, I do think that there are huge problems social media society nowadays where there is a lot of offense taken right for things or it and it and it used to be just brushed off as as like you know oh we're just taking the piss out of tony it's a joke you know me and you had a joke earlier about it only cost me an arm and a leg or mm. two mm. because you lost both arms yeah. and both legs that's funny mm. right it's funny to us just to shrug it off and have a laugh with it is kind of like that's not the done thing anymore. It is amongst closed groups, but I do personally, I do find myself suppressed to a level mm. and I might not consciously, you know, it's more subconscious than it is conscious. Like I'm, I might be at a party and I want to say something which is, would be deemed dark humor. Yeah. Offensive to potentially some people in the room, but hilarious at the same time. Yeah. You know, Ricky Gervais talks about it a lot. Um, do you think, do you think we're going down the wrong... Because we are on the cusp of something mm. which is quite big, right? And if we go down the route of... We, we've recently had like rappers, as an example, in Western Sydney that have just been cancelled for their events because of the way that their song is written. Right. I didn't hear about that. Yeah. So these guys are talking about, you know, gang life and all that mm. type of thing. It's an outlet for their creativity. I mm. think you should be able to say whatever you want. Actions are different to yeah. words, right? Yeah, of course. That's why, yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, yeah. um, are we how do we how do we change that because it, it's it's going down it's going down a road a road now which is quite you have to be careful about things i think it'll change itself <clears throat> because at its core it's untenable and uh it's not rooted in logic and those t things tend to iron themselves out with time mm. I, i've already started to see a shift in that whole space and there's a reactionary movement against it <laughs> um, which could go either way really the thing that bothers me about not being able to employ humor or, or feeling as though you are um, in a in a in a space that is more sensorial I guess is that humor is one of our our best tools in dealing with difficult topics you know like when something might be tragic or unjust or sad or whatever it is um sometimes humor is the best way to start a conversation about something mm. and if you breed a sensorial environment by which <laughs> nobody feels comfortable to even make a joke about something mm. uh, a lot of conversations aren't even going to start about how to fix something you know humor for the most part is there's got to be an element of truth to something even if you make a stereotypical joke about somebody, right? You know, and the, and that could be a complete overgeneralization. It yeah. tends to have to be. Right? It has to be, yeah. But there's got to be like an <clears throat> element of truth to it by yeah, which to people make it sort funny. of recognize. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, <clears throat> oh yeah, I kind of get that, right? Mm. And so in any piece of humor, there's an element of truth. And it's kind of like here comes the airplane when you're trying to feed, you know, vegetables to kids or something like that. Sometimes when we need to discuss really difficult ideas or topics, we need to make a joke about them first. Yeah. I do that when I meet people for the first time. Mm. I know that they're just thinking like, oh my God, like, what do I do? You know, do I shake his hand? And I often make a joke about being a pirate or a robot or, you know, shake the hook, it's as good as a hand or whatever I throw in there. Yeah, yeah. I'll make a joke about myself to mm. make them feel comfortable. And yeah. it also lets them know that they can ask any question that they want and I'm not sensitive about it. Yeah. And so humor is often used as a tool to actually diffuse so many situations and have conversations that we should be having. And so, you know, <clears throat> if you want to put the kibosh on that, I don't think you want to see where it ends up devoid of that. Yeah. 
we used to have a motto in the Marines, cheerfulness in the face of adversity. Mm. And it was always the darkest moments when you'd have the funniest yeah. story. Of course, because, because it's the antidote to the darkness. It's the antidote to yeah, the yeah. darkness, right? Yeah. And my, my, actually growing up, my mum's got a very dark sense of humour. And I remember when my nan died, this is a bit of a morbid topic, but when my nan died, she had dementia, right? Mm. And she had dementia for five years, six years. So she suffered quite a long time with it, completely mm. lost her memory at the end. Not a good way to go, right? But I remember being at a funeral and the only person crying was my missus. Mm. Because we were all in a sense of relief, right? But my mum, just before we went into the funeral, she went, well, it fucking took her long enough, didn't it? <laughs> Which we all fucking died with laughter, right? <laughs> Laughing. But my missus is just sat there because she doesn't know her. She's coming to a yeah, sad, what yeah. she thinks to believe is a sad yeah. event, right? But actually yeah. for us, it was like, wow, what a sense of relief. But and the man, ice it is a sad, the I mean, ice... she's right. It is a yeah, sad event. It is a really sad event. Your way of coping with that culturally is completely different to perhaps how she exactly. has grown up. Yeah. Exactly. But it was it was one of those moments where you go, wow, like humor is the best tool on the planet. Yeah. And to be offended by it is just like, mm. I just seem it as like so ridiculous, you know. To, to the bitter fucking <clears throat> end, I've always wanted like a gravestone, like spikes that says something like, I told you I was sick. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great one. <laughs> You bastards. <laughs> it was funny. my my grandmother who was you know lived in yeah. Carlton, she had dementia as well in the last uh, couple of years of her life. And I dementia kind of fascinated me, right? Because mm. for all she knew, she didn't have dementia. Yeah, that's all right? she knew, yeah. But everybody <laughs> around her kept telling her that she did. Yeah. And yes, that would be fucking depressing. <laughs> every myself, time, every day. You know, I've met kids in nightclubs at four o'clock in the morning that have had so much ecstasy that they forgot what they just said five <laughs> seconds ago. Right? It's kind of like that. Yeah, right? exactly. So if you go, if you're around your, you know, dementia ridden, ruled grandmother and, and said, well, why don't you fucking remember me? You yeah, know, yeah. like obviously they're going to get stressed. Yeah. But uh, the couple of times that I managed to get over to the UK to visit her and, you know, there were a couple of times where she clearly didn't know who I was. Yeah. And she was like, who are you? And I was like, well, it doesn't really matter at this doesn't point. doesn't matter, yeah. yeah. God, I remember my, my nan walked up to me once and we were, I was I was, tra I was leaving the Marines and I had to go on a course for five weeks. Mm. She'd just been, I think she'd, she'd had it for about a year at that point. So she was just getting slightly worse and worse and worse, but she could still live in her own house at that point. She wasn't a danger to herself. Yeah. Um, and she said, oh, would you like a cuppa? And obviously anyone that's English will just mm. respond yes. Doesn't matter what time of day, if it's the evening, the morning, you'll go, yeah, I'll have yeah. a cuppa. Um, and she comes back about a minute later. Do you want a cuppa? I think she came back about 12 times. Yeah. In the end, she just came back with hot water. <laughs> <laughs> and I was so like... it wasn't that you had 12 cups of tea. Do. You no, just no, had no. one cup. No, no. She just kept getting back to the kettle yeah. and then not remembering and then coming back again yeah. and then going back to the kettle. And I thought, well, at least she's exercising. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and she also thinks she's yeah. done something for you, which... Would give her that sense. Yeah, it of, gives a yeah. sense of satisfaction. I mean, I guess dementia wards. I mean, it's great because you know there are obviously other people there, and you, every time you see them, you can be like, "Do you remember you owe me fifty pounds from last time?" Yeah, yeah. you can make a lot of money. You can make a lot of there's, money. <laughs> but there's a place in the Netherlands um, that builds out an entire uh, small town. Like yeah, it's a fake town, like a dementia town. Yeah, for people with yeah, Alzheimer's, yeah. and they've yeah, got yeah. like a bus stop. And a, a little shop that they play can old go music. In and they, and yeah, yeah. There's no currency, but they're like, oh, I got to get some bread. And I thought it was a that's brilliant a great idea. idea. Yeah. I really love it. Yeah, yeah. My my nan thought she was on holiday. She genuinely thought that she was leaving every weekend and she was on holiday. They yeah. take them to the pub every day for lunch. And, mm. and yep, yeah, you're on holiday for well, another that, day. That, that <laughs> poses an interesting question. I mean, because I think to myself, well, if I if I were to spend the last couple of years of my life just thinking that I was on holidays. Um, I could think to myself, well, maybe that would be a good way to spend the last couple of years of my life. But then when I think about what I value now in my conscious mind, it's, uh, you know, the time that I spend with my partner or my dog or my friend, something like that. All these kind of memories, acute, long memories of, of kinship with another person. And so that got me thinking about, you know, to what extent do your memories define who you are and what is your ideal experience in life. Let me ask you a question that, um, that I heard, I think Daniel Kahneman asked, um, 
now. I've got to get this right. I'll, I'll, I'll do a version of it, right? Okay. If I were to give you two hundred thousand mm-hmm. dollars to go on a holiday for one week, okay. um, where would you go? What would you do? <laughs> Where would I go? What would I do? Two hundred thousand. I'm trying to. You got to spend all of it, it, and you can't take any of it with you. You got to spend all of it. You can't take yes. any of it with like you. After the week, you can't. So oh, you, you can't, can't like, take it back. Yeah, okay, okay. You can't like buy a yacht and then have <clears throat> that for the rest of your okay. life. Okay. So. I think I'd go on safari in South Africa. Okay. I safari think I'd take the whole family. Bring bring everyone, like not yep. just me, but the whole gang. Okay. Second <clears throat> question is. The same question, mm. uh, but at the end of the journey, of the trip, you and anyone you took with you wouldn't remember any of it. Oh. Yeah, why would you go? That's the question. Would you change your answer? Wouldn't remember any of it. So you still get to go on a holiday. You can do whatever you want. You can change your answer for this one. Mm. So it might not be safari in... South Africa. It might not even be with your family. Yeah. Uh, but <laughs> not to put you on the spot. Uh, but if you weren't going to remember and you have one week and $200,000, what would you do with that? Probably do something more selfish. Okay. Like what? I heard that you can do like a really exotic car, um, supercar driving experience in Japan. With like super wealthy people, it's an expensive holiday. Okay, interesting. <clears throat> Twenty cars. Yeah, they're all super right. rare, and you go through the mountains and you do like a two. It's it's basically two weeks, pretty much. Yeah, <clears throat> it's an interesting thought experiment, right? Because on the one hand, you've got a you know, we define the experiences that we have in life not as the experiences while we're having them, but as the memories they're going to create. Mm. And on the other, you think if you were just having an experience that was for the experience in the moment yeah. and you'd never remember it again, uh, you know, how would you attenuate that yeah. response? Um, is, is there such thing as enjoying a moment in the moment but never remembering it again? Did that happen? Yeah, there isn't, is there? I don't know. I mean, when I was uh, in hospital, I, I was getting a lot of um, uh, wound dressings done. This would happen every day. Mm. And it was a painful experience like I never knew existed. It was four to six hours a day and it was ripping bandages off open wounds. And it's it's really, really messed up to the point where I can't describe it. But I was given this drug called midazolam. And midazolam is like an amnesia type drug and it makes you actually forget uh, quite a lot of trauma. Mm. I still remember a lot of it. Uh, but obviously there's a bunch of it that was blocked out due to this drug. And... While I find value in the memory of suffering, I, d- I don't think I would find um, parallel advantage from more memory of suffering. Yeah. Right? And so my relationship with memory and experience versus benefit is a little bit different, I guess. Yeah. Mm. Cool. That is one to ponder on, isn't it? Let's end the podcast on this. Okay. What's something that most people don't know about you. Um, well, I do a lot of podcasts, so there aren't, aren't many things that people don't know about me. Um, what people don't know about me. Have you got anything you can throw in? Can you chuck anything in? Not that's appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> it's fantastic in the bedroom. <laughs> um, Is there something that you do outside of work or outside of the podcast life or outside of keynote speaking that's just like... Not like a normal thing that you do that people might not know about you. Normal thing that I do. Do I do any normal things? No. I don't think I do normal things. Um, I have really? fleeting interest. Sorry, what? Not really. <laughs> Fuck's sake. No normal things. Uh, I have I have an unhealthy obsession with dogs. There you go. I um I have a dog. Mm. Um, but yeah, my, like so much of my happiness is completely hinged on how many dogs I can see per day. Yeah. Well, I do like dogs more than humans. I yeah. always say about that. Yeah. It's like, what would I rather? We were talking about this earlier before the podcast started. Yeah. Was the the uh, the marine that wasn't going to leave Afghanistan because he had three hundred dogs. Yeah. Um, that he'd rescued there and he'd been living there for a few years and he 
utterly refused to mm. leave until a bunch of rich people basically sent a flight over there to get the dogs back. And I, I'd rather have most of the dogs back, to be honest. Yeah, <laughs> definitely, yeah. I take five hundred. The humans over. can. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, mate, it's been a pleasure having yeah, you on. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on. It's been great. Cheers, mate. We'll yeah. um, we'll put your details down in down in the descriptions and the comments and stuff. Um, if you like the video, please get in the comments, get amongst it, have an argument if you want. It just helps us with the views. And uh, have an ciao for now with me. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers.